Um, I want to thank uh, the, organiz the organizers for including me in the program. Um, for those of you who don't know me, I teach uh, in the music department at New York University, coincidentally. Um, let's see. It's a place in which um, Zanakis is not a household name at the moment. Um, I'm primarily a composer. Most of my work involves composition. Uh, I do acoustic music and electronic music, computer music. I was first exposed to computer music, uh, to electroacoustic music in my studies briefly with Bulent Orell at Stony Brook quite a while ago. And uh, in listening to some of the presentations this morning, I was just remembering uh, fondly how integral the visual arts was for him and how, how many conversations with him I had that revolved around tangential topics about form and structure that um, were only indirectly implied to be related to music, but, but they made into an intuitive sense to me back then, even. Um, and I did computer music later during my doctoral work at uh, the University of Washington. Um, the topic today is my responses to this particular piece by, uh, piano piece by Xenakis. The paper is meant to be speculative, I'm not an expert in architecture, and I'm not an expert in social theory. So these are really just um, composerly thoughts that are supposed to be provocative in response to um, my admiration for this particular piece and Zanakis' music in general. Um, I, I constructed a course a few years back, a graduate seminar on Zanakis' music, in which I spent the summer reading formalized music. And uh, one thing that Carl said, um, reminded me of my own, uh, probably the strongest impression I had after reading that book was how beautifully integrated um, Xenakis's creative and, and uh, rational sides of his creative personality were. So um, I have a written paper, which I'm going to read quickly because I think it's a little bit long. And then I hope I have time to play a, bit, a tiny bit of a piece. Every Ollie was written in 1973, and in, whoops, I'm sorry, let me just get my watch out so I can keep track. Every Ollie was written in 1973 and is Zanakis' second piano work. My paper on this piece is a conjecture about the significance for Zanakis of the graphic score itself. There are two unusual aspects of Every Ollie's notation that motivate my paper. The first quirk of every alley to which I've reacted is this. The score is not purely prescriptive. There are far too many instances of impossible to play synchronicities. Here's just one small example out of context. Um, how do I do this? Um, what I've created here was, uh, is a diagram that shows just randomly a, a measure that I selected from midway through, through the piece. These are this is a representation of eight successive 16th note synchronicities. Uh, so it's, it's one measure's worth. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. And this is where your fingers would have to be on the keyboard if you were to reach all these notes. The only two uh, sync 16th note moments that are actually playable are these two in green. <laughs> and this is that particular measure in musical notation, which doesn't reveal how impossible it is. Um, the second quirk is that in large chunks of the piece, the number of staves, sorry, the number of staves used, yikes, is excessive. In the example you've just seen, there are four staves employed in order to depict pitches that could easily and more clearly have been represented in a more condensed format. At the apex of stave density in this work, Xenakis uses five. On the first point, I considered initially whether every alley was a Xenakian anomaly. The question I asked was, is the piece unique in its degree or type of unplayability? It seems so. While there are articulative and virtuosic difficulties in other piano works of his, especially Herma and Mists, their respective challenges are theoretically related to speed. 
In other words, they can mostly be played accurately, though there are debates about what accuracy means. <clears throat> but they cannot be negotiated with accuracy at the proper speeds. In contrast, no degree of slowing down would enable a realization of every alley. It would take the addition of one or more fingers on a player's hand or a dwarf Turkish automata inside the piano, pulling the strings. As an unplayable piece, then, every alley might be viewed as Anakis is pushing the envelope in an abstract way. Beethoven did just this, for example, when he used pitches above F3 that were not yet on standardized keyboards. But since it is human physicality limitations, not the instrument design ones that are crucial for resolving every alley's performance dilemmas, what Zanakis has done is not at all analogous to Beethoven's moves. It's still interesting to wonder whether Zanakis would have weighed in one way or the other on a recent MIDI release of this piece on the Neos label. Regardless, a premise of my paper is that this piece was not for Zanakis an ambitious instantiation that looked forward toward future technological improvements. On the second point above, I asked, is the piece an anomaly regarding its state proliferation? Hyperstave distributions do exist elsewhere in Xenakis' music uh, and in his piano music, for example, Key Crops from 1986. But in the other cases that have come to my mind, there's strong justification for layered staves to articulate an intense rhythmic complexity. Without multiple staves, a dense miasma of unreadable specificities would result. But in every alley, there's no such need to elucidate micro-rhythmic counterpoint. The rhythms in the piece are deterministic, mostly omnipresent, <coughs> straight, driving 16th notes that are totally synchronized when there is polyphony. So what do these inevitably lost in performance notes mean? Is the score a platonic ideal such that Xenakis would have embraced the MIDI release? Contemporaneous discussions of the piece in the 70s, for example, Hill, Takahashi, and later Griffiths, were concerned with the lost notes, and they asked questions like, what is the intended sound? What are the best compromises toward it? What's an authentic performance of every ollie? The possibility, the possibility that the score might be a generalized version of itself to be used repeatedly to open the door to perception is what Takahashi contended. I'd like to emphasize that my paper is in no way an evaluation of whether or not playing these notes makes an aesthetic or structural difference to the piece. I'm simply asking, why did Zanakis bother to encode this conundrum? The pianists who debate which notes to relocate, which notes to delete, how to balance speed and accuracy, seem maybe not to consider that the score itself could have validity in its unheard state. Suppose, in other words, that the score is neither a generalized version of itself nor a representation of an idealized sound. In focusing on ontological aspects of the work that precede this, I'll simply ask what role the score itself might play if it's artificially isolated from the score to performance chain, that is, if it's simply read as an end in itself. I'm wondering aloud, therefore, to what extent is this composition partly music to see? Could it be music for us to inhabit in its spatial depiction and realization on the page? The fundamental point of my paper is that there's something enticingly and clearly expressive about Evriali's graphic representation as an anomaly in its essential non-descriptive and non-prescriptive facets. I don't believe that every alley's notation's an idealized version of itself, since there are certain key details that are left open. For example, um, and I'm thinking of um, our first talk this morning, even the metric marking is described by Zanakis as approximate, quote unquote. He does give a metronome marking, but it's an approximate one. I will suggest, rather, that the visual image, the notation as sign and code, can be viewed persuasively as a sonified social architecture, a depiction of imagined designs for inhabiting a lived-in space, tightly and loosely organized compartments for motion and interaction. Despite the rhythmic groove, the emergent emphasis on the pages is on complex and elegant 2D time-space movements. Could one liken the score image in time and outside of time to the trajectories of little musical entities moving through a large public park or a city center? Could the score be guiding and facilitating the patterns of movement that they make? Because of this piece's birth date, in France in particular, because of Zanakis' work with Le Corbusier, and most emphatically because of Zanakis' use by that date of random walks and arborescences, I felt um, emboldened to read in Zanakis' score intimations of a theme that was in the air globally and locally, namely urban renewal and criticism of government-designed quickly fabricated spaces. <clears throat> 
There was growing agitation for public space designs to be rooted in theories that were not only democratic in flavor, but which were humanistic, and included, for example, a design in certain French housing projects of kitchens that opened into the living areas, the stated gesture being, of course, to liberate women. And, of course, in France, there's a history of attention to public space design that reaches back well before the 20th century. The 19th century Jardin Luxembourg, for example, is a spectacular park that, like most French public spaces, is carefully designed. To move through it is to be subjected to a game plan that directs one's body and that molds one's personal experience in the public space. Looking for examples elsewhere of how public and semi-public space designs seem constructed to, influences, to influence one's way of living and being, we could all cons also consider 19th century European city design or African village dwelling design, the latter are often embodying fractal patterns. All of these varied designs shape, on a day-to-day -day basis, the inhabitants' identities and their per interpersonal relationships. Foucault, for example, traces the burgeoning of reflective city planning around controlled city life to the 18th century. And he identifies intensified space preoccupation in city planning as distinct from attention to space in architectural design. If Metastasius is about architectural space, Ebrioli, perhaps, even more clearly in contrast, is about the movement of bodies in space. As I've mentioned briefly already, one particular aspect um, that's linked to Ebrioli's moment of birth in 1973 is that there was an energetic public discussion going on then, both in France and the US, regarding urban renewal and utopian architecture. This discussion often took the form of theorizations about city rebuilding and development. Most of the theorizing saw itself as resistance to poor planning of modern cities. As Jane Jacob wrote, wrote even a decade earlier in her book about New York City, The Death and Life of American Cities, quote, this book is an attack on current city planning and rebuilding and an attempt to introduce new principles about common, ordinary things. Why some city parks are marvelous and others are vice traps. What, if anything, neighborhoods in great cities do? I won't try to summarize this text that reads almost like a novel and which describes already in 1961 the reasons that the Mornings, Morningside Heights neighborhood in New York City was in a state of decay despite assiduous applications of traditional planning theory. What I'm drawing attention to is simply that there was a theme in the air that lived experience was inherently valuable, valuable and inherently tied to one's body. I'm reference, I've referenced above the 20th century preoccupation with human versus machine capacities. The Turkish automata, after all, was contemporaneous with Mary Shelley's Frankenstein. And the 20th century obsession with human progress through transformations of nature. Genetic engineering is probably the present culmination of such ideas. In the 70s, at the time of this piece, the theme of human over nature was rather infused into feats of architecture, travel, and communications. Various flavors were in fact part of the official theme of the 1967 Montreal Expo, for which Zanakis designed his polytope. An influential text on theories of urban renewal appeared in France in 1979 by a writer named Jean-Francois Augoyard, Step by Step, Everyday Walks in a French Housing Project. This is the primary lens through which I will view, again speculatively, the inhabitation of time and registral space by the note inhabitants of every alley. I will consider them as a set of signs as Zanakis' exploration of invented social spaces. As many people here in the audience have no doubt realized, the spaces in Zanakis' music do seem to allow discovery and expression of, quote, profound individualities, to use Zanakis' words from the context of formalized music. Um, profound individualities through movement. Zanakis' sensitivity to the visual sense is another point of persuasion that this score may be about more than merely sound, and that it can plausibly be viewed as an artistic and imaginary expression of what Augayard would call inhabiting. If there's any use to this conjecture, we could then consider that there are at least two types of score inhabitation that take place. First, the inhabiting of the score instrument sound map by the performer, and second, a bit more fantastical, the inhabiting of the score by a virtual collective of sonic individuals in the guise of notes, every alley as a notational ambulation, 
generating movement and space itself, both inside and outside of time, albeit as a mode of being and of experiencing. Our inhabitation of the sounds as listeners is certainly another point to consider, but that's outside of this paper. So as Agur Yurt says in his 1979 text, quote, like all expression, one's walking conduct refers back to a context that situates it. In other words, one's ways of doing tell us in immediate way one's ways of being. Pedestrian statement signifies two things. One's immediate goal, going to work, going shopping, going home, going for a walk, and one's way of living the situation. This last signified encompasses, among other things, the dimensions of spatial position, temporal position, psychological attitude, and the presence of the other. Now, the contextual element most often mentioned by the inhabitants questioned, this is still the author talking, is a social referent, which is sometimes so explicit that it serves as a message. No one walks, it seems, without at least the vague presence of the instantiated principle of the collective, unquote. So these are from a chapter that he called uh, An Inhabitant Rhetoric, Figures of Walking. Do my proposed two types of a social architecture of notes relate in any way to each other? Is the score with, with its unplayability paradoxes capable of producing a new way of being for the performer? I would say certainly, in the sense that every alias score notation forces a particular way of making sense of the piece. Therefore, so long as we predicate a thinking performer, a new way of being does describe the performer's experience. Is this a being of multiplicity like Ives, which would be more literally analogous to the idea on the surface of multiple bodies moving in a space? Not exactly, I'd say, because Zanakis is much more, or seems much more to me, concerned about the individual, the individual notes, the individual lines, the individual silences in this piece. Uh, here is a page from the score that shows uh, a singular moment in the piece. Uh, there are a few other moments of shorter silences, but there's a somewhat bizarre 12-second uh, silence here. Uh, it's about a little more than a third of the way through the piece, I believe. Um, I'll elaborate a bit on the ideas regarding urban renewal. The theories of space design grew from concern about the malaise caused by modernized architectural and cityscape totalities. Combined with the timing of the 68 student unrest, the intention to city planning occurred in concert with more personally proximate sites of cultural revolution. Both musical repertoires and listening practices were being overturned. For example, new sorts of space and habitations included sitting on the floor, sitting close to the performer, these were common. For Xenakis, who sometimes eased in com into composing by swinging on a rope in his Paris atelier, such ideas would in theory seem to have been within his grasp. Our ways of structuring our bodies, whether guided through architecture, through music performance, through city design, or through iconic representations of these structurings, is, according to Aguillard, tied to an analytic deciphering of a phantasmatic space. But this is expressed adequately only if the inhabitation is active. Returning to the theme of the individual in society, then, it is this concept that, for me, is activated by the multiple staves situation in every alley. The city designs of the 60s were redolent of ideas of constructed utopias. And whether these utopias were those of Frank Lloyd Wright or Le Corbusier or Xenakis, there's in, they were all in some way, primary way, tied to the movements of lived and self-determining bodies. Corbusier's modular theories uh, especially are clear about this. As Fluxus organizer George Michunas said at one point about Corbusier, for Corbusier, space is a movement within itself. It's never at a standstill, just as sea is never without a wave. Space is a dynamic force that defines us. Machunas hoped for, quote, unquote, uh, quote, utopias containing more breadth than repressive architecture of bureaucracy and luxury. Um, such architecture imposes restrictions on people, causing everything to be forbidden. Touching, spitting, smoking, thinking, living. Use your imagination and share the property, he said. I'd like to now offer a few applied examples that are suggestive readings of Xenoxus's piece that apply, way, that apply ways of what I'll call social architecture to particular page notations. What are the ways of being 
that the musical-like entities of the musical-like, musical note-like entities that slide along the staves of every alley. Just as human figures in Augeyard's text do not move randomly, neither do the bulk of the figures in every alley. Uh, first, I'd like to show you a computer animation that I created of um, that point out why counterpoint would be so so uh, sort of anachronistically ineffective in terms of describing the mo movement of the individual lines. So this is the set you'll see in a moment. Um, This is the same measure that you saw represented in the first example. And here's a com computer animation that's playing the notes at the same tempo that Zanakis specified, which is about um, every 16th note is about um, a twelfth of, um, twelfth of a second, I believe. Sorry, an eighth of a second. 125 mi uh, microseconds, milliseconds. <laughs> so what I found interesting after I created this was that I, I was able to see things that I couldn't see very well on the page. You're seeing loops here, so it's a little bit, uh, it's emphasizing more, even more so, um, micro patterns in the movements, but they're very individualized. These are five, um, this is a passage that was represented on four staves, not fives, but there's essentially five lines of counterpoint, if I were to call it counterpoint. Uh, and they're each relatively, dis uh, relatively clearly delimited by a, a small interval, and this goes on for, for quite a while. But the movements are distinctive. So if, if you stared at them for a long enough time, it, it might seem to have be begin to have musical personalities. Um, okay. Um, Ogier use, uses a whole set of um, of complex terms to describe categories of movement through urban space. They range from things like exclusion, staggered polysemy, combinatory figures. Redundancy, symmetry, dissymmetry, synecdoche, which, in which a part stands for the whole. And then he also talks about orders of inhabiting, which are three, abstraction, hom homogenization, and binary division. And I simply took two and um, thought about whether there would be provocative ways to talk about moments in the piece. Um, here's what I came up with in terms of his principle of homogenization, which he defines as in, in this way. Inhabited space is lived partially in a discrete way with absences and in a heterogeneous way. The representation of the globality of this space is imaginary in nature. Expression of this principle takes various forms. Again, this is still the author talking. Here is one. Globality takes on meaning in each concrete articulation of inhabiting, which convokes and evokes it. The part has meaning only in relation to the totality that grounds it. Um, what could this mean even regarding architecture? I'll suggest an example drawn from the Jacobs text, 1961 text. Quote, a city sidewalk by, not by itself is nothing. It's an abstraction. To keep a city safe, a sidewalk's fundamental task, which is a fundamental city, which is a sidewalk's fundamental task, it's necessary for there to be three qualities in place. Public, private, demarcation, eyes on the street, and users on the street. How would one achieve this? And she goes on to enumerate ways that include things like stores, public places, permanent tenants, diversity of inhabitants. Um, the streets in, in every alley are certainly populated. Uh, let's see here. 
the, the example that I started with is certainly a public space where everyone can see and hear each other. Let's go back. Where did these notes come from? What draws them to the space? Stave two from the bottom comes from the public space of measures one to three of the piece. Stave one comes from um, hidden embedded B, C sharps that have a very different behavior here than, than the first two pages of the piece. Um, I won't go into all details because of lack of time, but uh, I left out the all-encompassing quadruple forte here, but even that certainly speaks to to um, a gesture that draws all of these all of these um, pitches, note events, into the same world. How are they distinguished through their particular nuanced motions, as you saw in the animation? Back and forth motions between the two boundary points that are the structural skeleton of each voice or person. Um, the final point that I wanted to try to draw um, a suggestive analogy from in the text is that uh, Olga Yar says that inhabiting expresses itself also through breaks, cuts, and opacities, through excesses and overflows of the fragmented onto the constructed totality. In deforming the totality, it gives out um, a movement of configuration involving themes of transparency, fusion, and the opening of sites. Again, I'll turn to an example from, from the Jacobs text. Streets provide us, uh, provide the principal visual scenes in our cities. Too many of them present us with a confusing contradiction, foreground activity of an intense sort, and amorphous repetitions of this, endlessness. Um, therefore, we need interruptions. We need, whether they be topography, hills, slopes, bridges, parks, or plazas. So, uh, I, th I think you get the idea here in terms of the, the reasons, the way the justifications for particular types of city design were being, were being uh, articulated. So here are my, here are my examples of uh, things that I thought looked nice. These, these are very dramatic um, musical gestures that I can't think of a particular uh, pitch class set analytic way to really describe persuasively what's what's happening here. There's and there's very few aesthetic formal reasons that would explain why something happens when it does, or or why these dramatic changes in texture textural design happen. Um, Jane Jacobs talks about uh, dips dips in the road corners. All the sorts of things that that add an aesthetic dimension to lived-in life. Why why we find some cities drab? Why we find some cities beautiful cities and enjoy um, spending time in them? She says has a lot to do with with our aesthetic experience of them. So here are some some dips in the road. Pretty strange events that come out of nowhere. Here's a corner. Why does that happen? It's, I think, one of, the, one of the nice things, one of the wonderful things about so much of Zanakis' music is, is that nothing is quite predictable. But this piece in particular is um, very articulated. So there's, there's huge differences between the textures, the density of the textures. And the entire piece is, um, I believe, less than nine minutes. Here's a little edifice kind of bizarre, a piece in which there's this one five-note cluster. Actually, it's a, an eight-note, a nine-note cluster. It's a singularity. Again, like so many of these other examples that I'm showing, these, these are singularities in the entire piece. Here's an eye-catching moment. Again, these are also unplayable, these huge swaths of completely filled-in notes. Um, and here's a populated street. Again, so, so much of this is unplayable. Um, 
How, if at all, do Oyard's ideas relate to those of Corbusier, who was such a decisive influence on Xenakis? There are significant methodological differences that are interesting. Oguillard conveys skepticism in his book about the static architectural thought of Corbusier, as expressed in the latter's modular, which had erected postures, not gates, into paradigms for an inhabitant's lived experience of everyday comings and goings. He writes, a topographical translation, like any interpretation based on continuities and, and continuities, seemed to us an improper way of accounting for spatial practices as they are lived day to day. Again, according to David Curtis, who translated the text um, a few years ago, quote, it's the movement itself, not the positions taken up in its succession, that according to my reading are most significant. Curtis notes Augeyard's own reflection on how the analogy with graphic expression is striking. Just as a book is read in company with emotionless rewriting, meaning it's rewritten, meaning it is written at the same time that it's read, sometimes rather more than, uh, sometimes walking resembles a reading writing. It's rather more following an existing path than hewing a new one. Uh, let me try that sentence again. Sometimes walking is rather more following an existing path, sometimes rather more hewing a new one. One moves within a space that never tolerates the absolute exclusion of the one or the other, unquote. In other words, a reading is precisely a rewriting. Um, let's see, do, do I have, no, no time. Okay, would, would you like to hear 15 seconds of the piece, perhaps? 15 seconds. Thank you. 